Okay, so the um, second part of the Evolution of the Living Earth course will be mostly about the climate of the Earth. Okay, and this is important because basically the, the climate, the temperature of the Earth, how much precipitation we have, uh, all the things that go into the climate also determine how habitable the planet is. Okay, so the, the first part of uh, these few lectures will go on to develop uh, a series of equations uh, or models that allow us to describe what um, determines the temperature of the Earth. Okay, so what is it that can cause the, the temperature to warm up, what can cause the, the temperature to cool down, uh, and then we'll go through and, and look through a number of examples through Earth history about what are the drivers of these changes. Okay? But before we do that, we have to basically go through and develop this model and, and show that we can understand why it is the, these changes in these parameters are, are causing the changes in the Earth. Okay? So what we're going to do is, in the first lecture, we're going to go through constructing this simple model. Okay, so what I want you to do is to watch this video because this basically starts that process. Okay, so this video goes through taking a, uh, uh, a very, very simple set of assumptions and we make a, a very, very simple model, uh, which turns out to be wrong, but we'll go through that in the lecture. Makes a very simple model uh, that allows us to make a prediction about the Earth's temperature and we can compare that to what we, we, we think the Earth's temperature is and then, then we can say something about what is maybe missing in our model and, and we'll go on and improve our model in the lectures. Okay, so just watch this video, okay? Um, make sure that you, you kind of understand some of the, the concepts that are, that are gone through, okay? So first of all, this is the kind of model that we're going to be considering. Uh, so we've got basically energy coming in from the sun, okay, that kind of arrives at the Earth's surface, some of that is intercepted, um, okay, and then some other stuff happens on over this side where energy gets radiated back out to space, okay, some of that gets absorbed by clouds and, and the atmosphere, okay, and we're going to develop a model that can, can incorporate all of these that allows us to predict the temperature of the Earth, okay, and we're going to see what goes into that model in terms of what can we change in that model that will change the temperature of the Earth, okay? And that basically underpin kind of this series of lectures, okay? What causes the temperature of the Earth to change, okay? But first of all, I'm going to describe a simple model that just looks at this side over here, okay? So it just looks at the incoming and the reflected radiation and ignores this kind of stuff over here. We'll leave that kind of thing to the, to the first lecture. Okay, but before we do that, the uh, first thing we've got to consider is this little bit of physics here. So uh, don't worry if you don't understand all of this, but basically just kind of take home the, the end of kind of like slide message here. But basically, the hotter something is, okay, so in this case over here we've got um, uh, so a piece of iron that's just come out of a forge. The hotter something is, the more energy it radiates away. Okay, so uh, hot things give out lots of radiation. Uh, um, cold things give out, give out less radiation, okay? Uh, and there's also, in addition to this amount of radiation, uh, there's this uh, uh, there's this uh, kind of rule that the, the the hotter something is, the the type of radiation that gives out is more short wave. Okay, so it becomes more and more closer to the ultraviolet uh, end of the electromagnetic uh, radiation, whereas uh, colder objects give out. Uh, longer wavelengths, so things that are very, very cold, like the universe, that gives out kind of like a microwave or radio uh, background uh, wavelengths, whereas things that are very hot, like the sun, uh, that gives out visible light. So you can see here that the, the hot area of the iron is giving out kind of these yellow colors, okay, uh, which are shorter wavelength than the colder bits, which are giving out the red color, okay. And this is kind of described down here in this, in, this, in, this, in this graph at the bottom here. So each of these curves represents uh, what we call basically a, a black body object. And black body doesn't necessarily mean the object is black. It just means it, it basically obeys this kind of perfect behavior where the amount of uh, energy that it um, radiates is basically the, the, the perfect amount for that temperature. Okay? It also means that that kind of object will absorb all of the energy that's radiated onto it. We'll come to that later. So, for instance, an object that's 300 degrees Celsius will give out kind of low intensity radiation at longer wavelengths down here. And as we increase to, say, a higher um, temperature object, say a 3,000 degree um, 
kind of object that gives out much more radiation. So the area under this curve is a lot larger, and also the the, the maximum kind of wavelength of that is a lot. The maximum intensity, sorry, is a lot shorter. So we're looking at maybe one micrometer. So that's kind of a thousand, um, a thousand nanometers. So this is kind of six thousand. We're getting into a couple of hundred nanometers, and that's this is the kind of the area of visible light. Okay, so this is kind of like the the temperature of the sun. So that's giving out a huge um, amount of energy um, at a short wavelength. Okay, um, and there's this rule. Uh, that we're going to use that basically the total radiation emitted so that's the area under this graph here for any temperature any temperature so if you basically take that temperature in Kelvin and we'll come on to what Kelvin are later um, and basically raise that to the fourth power so times it by itself four times and then times it by the Stefan Boltzmann constant which is this number here that gives you the amount of energy okay so the, the basically the, amp, the energy flux that's being released from that so the power so power is the flux of energy. Okay. So I mean, first of all, uh, when we're talking about the, the the Earth and its temperature, okay, the Earth gets almost all of its energy from the sun. Okay. So there's a there's a really tiny amount from um, from geothermal heat flux, but it's dwarfed by the amount of energy we get from the sun. Okay. And that's because the sun is really hot. I mean, it's really really hot. Okay. And it's really big. Um, so the total power of the sun is this number of watts here, something times 10 to the 26. So this is a huge power of the sun, okay? Again, so the, the surface of the sun is, a, is, a, is very, very hot, but it is a very, very long way away, okay? So this huge amount of energy, as you move further and further and further away from the sun, that gets spread out more. So imagine uh, uh, basically an enormous sphere of radius, oh, I think we've got it here, enormous sphere of radius r okay so if this is this is the sun this is the earth imagine a huge sphere okay that's spread out um, over the, the whole solar system but is only as big as far away as the earth is um, then the, all of this power would be spread out over that sphere and that's what this equation is describing down here so that's the solar flux so the amount of energy that the earth receives okay per unit area is the, the power of the sun divided by this uh, term here, which is basically the, the, the surface area of this huge imaginary sphere that is um, the radius of almost 150 million kilometers. Okay, so this is this number here is the solar flux, okay, the solar constant okay. at the Earth. Okay, so that, that energy which is coming in from the sun, that is intercepted by the Earth, and you can see the Earth here. Okay, but it's intercepted only by the area of the, the Earth which the sun effectively sees. So that, imagine that's just basically a disk that's the same size as the Earth's shadow. Okay, so that's essentially pi times the radius of the Earth, and bizarrely I've written down A as the radius of the Earth, not to confuse it with R, which is the, the distance between the Earth and the sun. Okay, so the, the total amount of uh, energy that the Earth receives is the energy per unit area times the area of the Earth's shadow. Okay, but the Earth is, is a sphere and it rotates, so that, that energy is spread out over the whole of the Earth. Okay, so to get the, the flux per unit area, the amount of solar energy coming in per unit area of the Earth, okay, we need to divide by the uh, surface area of the Earth, and that's this bit down here in this equation and this there's lots of cancelling that can go on here so we cancel those guys out okay so we just get the amount per unit area in the earth is the solar flux divided by four okay and this four is because we live on a spherical planet okay which is kind of fortunate um, okay so now we've basically defined how we get this number here okay this 341 okay we want to think about now what happens once that energy basically starts arriving at the Earth. Okay, we have this term called albedo. Okay, and albedo will feature a lot in um, lectures. But this is basically the amount of energy that is not that basically doesn't make it into the Earth. Okay, but is reflected off the Earth and doesn't really interact with the Earth anymore, or is reflected off clouds uh, in the atmosphere and back out into space. Okay. And we can see that different parts of the Earth might be different reflectivities. So, say places like this ice sheet here. Okay, this this is very white. This is very reflective. So, almost all of the radiation that arrives 
at the surface here will bounce straight back off again. But some other areas, kind of like these, this dark water or these dark trees, okay, a lot more energy is going to be absorbed because these are darker surfaces, they're less reflective. Okay, so we can go now to, to try and construct a model. So we've got our energy coming in, okay, and some of that energy is reflected back out into space, okay, and we can work this out from, 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 from the reflective or the shininess of the planet, the albedo. Okay, so some energy must be going into the Earth. Okay, because not all of the energy is reflected. Okay, so this causes the Earth here to start to warm up. Okay, because it's receiving energy, and because it starts to warm up, it will then have a temperature. Okay, and anything but the temperature will it start to emit uh, energy based on its temperature. Okay, so that's that 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 law we um, Stefan Boltzmann relationship that we described earlier. Okay, so if we uh, reach a steady state where the, the temperature of the planet here is not changing, so it's basically warmed up um, to its kind of like equilibrium temperature, the amount of energy that's being inputted into the system here must be equal to the amount that's being exported out um, to, uh, to space due to the, the Earth heating up and emitting its own energy. Okay, so we kind of think about writing that kind of thing down. So we've got the incoming shortwave radiation, okay, so that's this term uh, here, Okay, and the amount reflected is basically this term here, which is this term A, which is the albedo or the reflectivity, okay, which is defined as the, the fraction of the incoming radiation that is reflected out to space. Okay? So the amount that the Earth absorbs is essentially just is the total coming in minus that which is reflected. Okay? And that's what's written down at this bottom equation here. Okay? So this is this term minus this term, and that's all we've written down down here. I've just factorised out this uh, s naught over four. So this is how much the planet is receiving from the sun that isn't lost by the first reflection. Okay, and then we've got this other term. So that's that term at the top here. Then we've got this other term. So the planet itself here has heated up to some equilibrium temperature, and that's causing it to radiate energy out into space. Okay, and that can be described by this simple relationship here. So the amount that's being radiated, the amount of energy being radiated out of space is um, the Boltzmann, Stefan Boltzmann constant times the temperature in Kelvin raised to the power of four. Okay, so we can we can we can basically can start to construct our model now. And we can say that the amount of energy absorbed is equal to the amount of energy that is being emitted. Okay, and that's that's just this equation here. Okay, now we can rearrange that equation because this is just it's a simple algebraic equation, um, but it's got things we know in it. Okay, so we know the solar flux. And we might be able to make an estimate of the albedo. Uh, the Stefan Boltzmann constant is a constant, and we just want to know that the, the basically this, which is the temperature of the Earth. Okay, um, so this is rearrange that equation. Okay, and you should be able to kind of work that through in your own uh, in your own special way. Uh, but now we have an equation that describes the temperature of the Earth. Earth. Okay. Uh, so we just need the albedo. Okay. So this is actually a map of the distribution of the reflectivity uh, of, of, the, um, of the Earth's surface. So you can see that the places like uh, the poles, so down here in Antarctica and up in the um, Arctic and over Greenland, we have very, very high albedos, very high reflectivity, so above 70%. And that's because these areas are covered in snow or ice, so they're very, very shiny stuff. Uh, light reflects off them very easily. Okay? Whereas uh, the ocean, okay, so the ocean is actually kind of mostly dark, because it's kind of like, if you look at the ocean, it's kind of a dark blue, and that absorbs uh, a lot of uh, the uh, visible light that, that comes in um, from the sun. Okay? But we can kind of try and average out this spatial uh, uh, difference to get kind of like a globally represented value. Okay, and we do that and we get about 0.3. Okay, so you can see that most of this is kind of like around some blues, around 20. Some of the, the continents are kind of a little bit more um, reflective. Okay, particularly desert regions. Okay, you can see the Sahara here is a little more reflective. Uh, this is the Sahara over here. Um, okay, so we've got about 0.3. We can start to plug in some numbers. Okay, so we know the solar flux, we know, we can estimate this 0.3, and we can, uh, we know what the Stefan Boltzmann constant is because, well, because I told you. Um, so we do that, and we get 255 Kelvin, 
Okay, so we can convert that into Celsius to get something that we can kind of like actually kind of like more comprehend in terms of real world experience. So naught degrees Celsius is uh, approximately uh, two hundred seventy three. 0.15 degrees Kelvin. Okay, and the, the difference between the, the the magnitude of one Kelvin is the same as the magnitude of one um, Celsius. Um, so that that makes the temperature of the Earth uh, that we're estimating with this model uh, minus 18 degrees Celsius. Okay, so does that seem reasonable? Um, well, apparently, according to NASA, the average temperature of the Earth is approximately 15 degrees Celsius. Okay, so our model is okay. And we're not hundreds of degrees Celsius out, okay? But there are things in our model, so we're, we're predicting, our model predicts a temperature which is quite a bit colder than the average, the actual average temperature of the Earth, okay? So we might want to think about some reasons why that is, and whether this term here actually represents the average temperature of the Earth, or does this TE actually represent something else in the Earth system? Okay, so... Uh, revise all of this or kind of go through this again if you didn't understand it um, and we'll move on from here in the first lecture okay so um, this is not really uh, part of the the, the the introductory video but some of you may uh, be a little bit concerned about the amount of math that we just went through um, this is just to kind of reassure you that this was kind of like the I think this is probably the most math that we're going to be asking you to do. So we're all we're, the, the math that's going to be involved in uh, this uh, climate part of the course is just this kind of rearranging of equations. You might be asked to factorise things out. Um, and we're basically very, very simple mathematical um, uh, manipulations and rearranging of equations. So uh, you should be hopefully familiar with uh, terms like factorization. Um, grouping terms together um, uh, where you kind of uh, using exponents so things to the power of, of other things um, so also sim familiar with uh, things like sci the scientific notation where we're writing out numbers in terms of uh, something times 10 raised to the power of something and that could be a negative power or positive power so if, you, if you're not so uh, um, up to speed with all of that stuff um, then let me know and I can uh, point you towards some, some resources um, online on Learn, or maybe make uh, some of the, the introductory maths from the Earth Modeling Prediction course available to, um, to you, uh, which will hopefully um, make things a lot simpler or at least clearer. Um, anyway, don't, don't be too put off by the maths. Um, it's not, not all so bad. Um, so this, this, this slide here that's up here, is, it's not, it's not going to be anything uh, as complex uh, as uh, this. Okay. End of uh, end of uh, end of broadcast. <laughs>